sonically, I hadn't really heard anything like that before. Um, it was this weird cacophony of like strange alarms and sounds. And... Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Accolades Conversation Series, in which I talk to some of my favorite artists about who or what they would recommend me checking out. Make sure to subscribe to our channel or hit the like button. This episode is in collaboration with Sonic City Festival, a three-day curated festival in Kortrijk, Belgium, from the 11th till the 13th of November, organized by Welde Westen. This year's edition is curated by Low, Black Country, New Roads, and Gilla Band. Some other bands already added to the lineup are Goat, Dry Cleaning, Coco Co, Le Fils de Elegadat, and the musician you'll hear me talk to, Billy Nomates. Check out the lineup on soniccity.be, where more names will be added soon. Tor Maris, who performs as Billy Nomates, is a solo British songwriter and musician who now lives in Bristol, England. She released her self-titled debut album in 2020 and featured on Mork and Mindy by Sleaford Mods in 2021. She released the Emergency Telephone EP in October 2021, produced by herself on Geoff Barrow's label, Invada Records. BBC Radio 6 music DJ Amy LeMay chose Billy Nomade's debut as her album of the year in 2020. I spoke to Tor about BC Camplight, born Brian Cristinzio, an American songwriter and multi-instrumentalist. His 2005 album Hide Runaway was released by One Little Indian and featured Cynthia G. Mason on vocals. Camp Light's follow-up, Blink of a Nihilist, was released in 2007. The third album came out in January 2015 on Bella Union. Cristingio's later lyrics regularly explored his personal life and self-destructive tendencies, including struggles with depression and alcohol. If you are into my illustrations, this accolade series started as an illustration book, which you can still get on our website, greatrecords.be. This is what Tor had to add. I had a good think about this and there's always like there's so many people isn't there like that kind of shape uh, your thoughts and ideas and you feel like I've been really influential that, that just don't seem to um, pierce through like a mainstream avenue but um, I've actually gone for BC Camplight have you heard of him? No. Okay great yeah so BC Camplight is the uh, musical project of a guy called Brian Christienzo I think that's how I pronounce Christianzio. Christianzio. Brian Christianzio, there we go. He's actually an American songwriter, but he lives here in the UK. He lives in Manchester, England. I think he started making records in the US and he was doing, I think, okay. I think he was a session piano player for Sharon Van Etten. Van, Van Etten? Oh, God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Terrible with pronouncing. I'm so dyslexic, so I'm going to say everyone's name's wrong. <laughs> Defend everybody. And I, I, hand on heart, do not mean it. But yes, yeah, so he was a session player, I think, on a few people's records. Uh, I think he played with The War on Drugs, I read somewhere. Anyway, he's an incredible pianist, but he's also a really interesting songwriter. The first album that I was aware of from BC Camplight was a record called How to Die in the North, which uh, came out on Bella Union, which is, I think, a UK-based label. Um, and it had a song on it called I'm Desperate. And sonically, I hadn't really heard anything like that before. Um, it was this weird, cacophony of like strange alarms and sounds and everything felt a bit on the edge and musically the production of it I found just and still do find so interesting because for a song that's titled I'm Desperate it really like throws you over the edge you know and um, I was sort of fascinated by that he had a record after House Die in the North called Deportation Blues which is actually based around the fact that he, uh, I read and I've, I actually, I know Brian, not personally, but we speak occasionally um, as artists that are aware of each other. And I know that Deportation Blues is actually based upon the fact that after How to Die in the North did really well, and he was starting to get notable recognition, and he was getting offers for TV and things were going well. He had a leg injury and he ended up being deported back from England to America. 
I sense that he kind of missed a lot of these opportunities that he'd been working on and then ends up writing Deportation Blues, which is an amazing album. <laughs> um, and based on truth, you know, which I think the best albums are. And then skipping ahead, so this is just kind of the albums, like chronologically, I guess, but skipping ahead to where I had really honed into what he was doing and why I started to really appreciate him was a record that came out in 2020, um, which I, I have a real affinity with Brian because I also put my record out in 2020. And I think anyone that did that, we, we all have this shared trauma <laughs> from it. And um, I don't. I started, I started a record shop in 2020, so. <laughs> right, so you understand what we're saying. Like, yeah. We went out on a limb, we did this, and it was a bit, it was quite ride and ride or die, the whole thing. But Brian really captured my imagination and kind of my heart with a record called Shortly After Takeoff, which came out um, April 2020. I think it came out at the absolute pinnacle of everything mm -hmm. going terribly wrong <laughs> and being really serious and scary actually in the UK for a long time. Other probably was the same across the world, wasn't it? Because I'm about to release a record next year and I've only ever released records in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. My entire, same as you, my entire professional career is pandemic operations. So I've no idea how it actually goes. <laughs> um, but so, um, yeah, so Brian puts this record out right at the beginning of like this, the real severity of lockdown. Like we're in, back in April, 2020, especially in the UK, it was it was quite scary. Like we still didn't know anything about this virus and it felt, the whole thing felt quite apocalyptic for a long time. Uh, and I think Brian writes apocalyptically better than any writer I know. And um, shortly after takeoff is kind of all about, it just had such a, for me, this real lush, dark tone to it. Um, and the production choices on it are also very, uh, they're just, he makes some brilliant decisions with things, you know, like his instrumentation, it's, he, ha he operates with a full band, but his production, is, and I think he, he does produce all of his records. In fact, I'm pretty sure he does. And it's, his choices are just so interesting because he will, he will just throw an instrument in there and you go, I have, don't even, I don't know what that is. You know, I have no idea what that instrument is, but it sounds great. And he'll do it in a succession. So like you can listen to a song and you really don't know what's going to come next. And, and that really excites me because I, I find that really like, ah, you know, that, that really fires you up as a songwriter that someone's kind of put that level of detail and thought into something. Um, and he'll do things where like, you know, he, he always, for me, gives me a sense of like teetering over the edge. Like he makes his, some of his songs have like a nauseous quality to them in a, in a really good way. Like um, he has these kind of like effects that feel like dipping aeroplanes, like almost like when you're on a ride or a plane and like it suddenly dips or goes down, like sonically he manages to do that. And I find that just like, yeah, I, I love that. And um, yeah, so shortly after takeoff, I mean, it's just, and, and the reason I want to speak about it is because it did do really well here in the UK. People do talk about it. Um, is he and, still, is he already back in the UK or is he still, uh, is he living in, in, in the Yeah, I think he is. I, I know he went back to the States at some point this year, but I think he's coming back. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that he's got a record coming out next year. And I also know it's a really hard time to be a band. I hope that he can navigate all of that and continue to play live and because it's really difficult for bands in the UK. Uh, your career going uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, does that mean like you had a lot of live shows that were postponed and stuff like that? And like, yeah, uh, yeah. Because, so I, yeah. I'm still playing out a lot of my 2020 shows now, mm -hmm. you know, which feels a bit odd because that's two years ago and the material that was written a year before that. So it's a three, that's just the whole part of life that got frozen. Mm -hmm. So to kind of go out and do it 
I mean, the more I've done it this year, I've got into it. But to begin, I, you know what? To begin with, I really disliked it. Are you scheduling yourself around that timing of like I have to tour before I make new music, or were you working on new music in the in the in the meantime? Kind of had two feet in both camps, really, which I was fortunate enough to be able to do. Um, yeah, I was kind of dipping in and out, which again, I don't know. I mean, it was it was strange because your head is trying to figure out this new dynamic or this the kind of new direction, and you're living out these things that should have happened. But does that mean that the reactions to your album were coming in positive, but you still didn't know how people were actually reacting because you haven't been in front of like audiences? Absolutely. It still happens now, like it's odd because, yeah, it was like a two year freeze where people were sat with the album or and I put an EP out as well, so sat with this material. And then like the first time, I mean, I only really went to Europe this year, actually. I only really did a few European shows this year. And I'd done a couple of festivals and people are at the front and they know the words and it absolutely mm. blows my mind. It's it's super cool, but I'm, I'm I, you know what, I end up feeling quite suspicious because I'm like, how do you know it though? Like, <laughs> I've never been here, you don't know me. Like, and that's the power of music, I guess. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, so that, you know, that, that is, that is, that is an interesting one, but you know, some things work at shows and some things don't, and it's not until you truly have an audience and you're uh -huh. in a different venue every night that you get to know that. So, but but so but so if I get it right, after your album was released, I mean, you you had singles obviously, but like it's, uh, did did you know which songs were gonna work, and was it a surprise when you started doing the live shows? to see if other songs were working better or not? Yeah, it's an interesting one because the way I operate live is like, I have a very minimal setup. I operate with a lot of playback and um, and then a vocal kind of, and then quite physical performance. So in terms of sort of rehearsing how the performance would look, that never really happened. I kind of just went out and did it. And in some ways, I think it's actually worked in my favor because it's a very, for me, it feels like a very natural show that just kind of happened. It's not choreographed in any way. It's not massively curated in any way. It just kind of happens mm -hmm. and it kind of ends up just being what it is. And I, I hope, yeah, I hope that that kind of resonates with the audience. But um, yeah, I think I was interested by songs like Call In Sick that I never really paid a lot of attention to. I just thought it was just a, a song, an album song, which I think, you know, in 2020 becomes like, I mean, who the hell writes a song about a virus taking down your workplace at that time? I mean, it was just <laughs> an absolutely insane thing that happened. Um, because obviously I wrote that in 2019 when the world was like, okay. But... Before the pandemic, were you already like a... Uh, uh... A full-time musician or did that happen during during the pandemic it kind of happened during the pandemic through accident in all honesty because no i was working um i was working i worked at a small marketing department um basically just yeah just doing kind of like office work and before that i was just working in shoe shops and mm. anything i just did i had so many different jobs um yeah, and so what happened was is that I was I was living in a student house working for quite low down in a university and it kind of just all collapsed at once. Like they shut, they closed, they couldn't afford to furlough me because I was only so many hours. And so I kind of just ended up, and I had the album. Um, and so I was kind of, the hope was, was that I'd put the album out and be like, bye bye work, I'm finished. But what actually happened was I kind of lost my job, put the album out, and then was like, well, shit, I better make this work then. <laughs> well, you, you, you were kind of pushed in like a, a scary situation by, by accident in some way, which is maybe like the best way for it to happen, like instead of like having to make that choice and maybe end up with nothing, so, you know. Well, totally, because like it felt a bit, it was, it's a bit risky to do that on an mm. album where nobody knows you. Like, I don't think it's, I don't think anyone does that, you know, if they don't need to or don't have to. Um, so then, I, yeah, so then it kind of ended up just being like, okay, well, let's just, and I was f like, full transparency, I was fortunate that I, I moved back into my dad's house um, around that time because obviously I wasn't able to pay rent and things and you know 
And I was 30 years old and I'd lived independently since I was 50. Let's hope by the time that you play in Belgium in November that everything is still the way it is. So, you know. Isn't that crazy? It's like we're not even hoping that it gets better. We just need it to not get worse. Mm -hmm. And like it's not exactly good like now. And, and I think that's a crazy, yeah, I find that a crazy disposition of modern life now is that we just hope that like the day rolls out and that actually that's the best. That's all we can do, isn't it? It's just have a little bit of hope else we wouldn't do anything like yeah i want to thank billy nomates for this interview again sonic city from the 11th till the 13th of november in uh, the park kortrijk organized by wilde westen you can get your tickets on soniccity.be next week i'm talking about canadian rapper chaos with shad who you might recognize from the netflix documentary hip-hop evolution check it out and thanks for listening <laughs>